I guess we'll get started. Um, I'll try to keep it short because I'm losing my voice and it's annoying to listen to. Um, welcome everyone to CSIS. I'm Jennifer Cook. I direct the Africa program here. Uh, today's session, uh, The Race Against Time in Somalia with Matt Bryden. Um, just a little word of introduction. About uh, three years ago, uh, Somalia uh, got a new federal government and uh, dropped the transitional epithet from its name. Uh, and ushered in a, yet another window of opportunity um, that we were all very optimistic about, not all of us, I should say. Um, uh, new federal government uh, reestablished relations with the United States in January of 2013. Um, uh, the idea was that Somali, uh, Al Shabaab was somewhat on the back foot, Amazon was making progress. Um, we, uh, Secretary Kerry traveled to, to Mogadishu, first Secretary of State ever to, to travel to Somalia last year. Uh, we've, the President uh, just recently nominated um, Stephen Schwartz as um, uh, a potential U.S. ambassador to Somalia, a big, a big first. Um, he just came from working on Nigeria, which uh, having solved that problem, he moves on to the next one. Um, and uh, we hosted in January 2013 the President Hassan Sheikh Mohammed here at CSIS. It was an enormous crowd, very optimistic, very ebullient, um, and a lot of support, uh, kind of moral support for the President at that time. But it's pretty clear right now that Somalia is not out of a transition. It's got big deadlines ahead and a schedule on, in terms of a constitution, in terms of national elections that have kept being pushed back or, or narrowed in scope. Uh, and the last uh, few months, we've seen a major reassertion of Al-Shabaab going after Amazon forces, uh, which are overstretched right now and not entirely clear to me kind of what their mandate and mission is at this point. Um, so to talk about kind of progress and the way ahead, we're delighted to welcome back Matt Bryden. Matt is a longtime expert on Somalia. He currently leads the Sahan Research Group, which is a think tank in Nairobi. He was uh, head of the UN, coordinator for the UN Eritrea Somalia Mo uh, Monitoring Group, uh, formerly at Crisis Group, head of the Horn of Africa practice, uh, and just someone who, over the years, we have turned to for kind of solid insight and longstanding, long established network that he has. Um, and advice on Somalia. Um, he's, he will be the first to warn about windows of opportunity and over-optimism, and has written a couple of reports for CSIS in the past, uh, Somalia Redux, uh, uh, Reinvention of, of Al-Shabaab, and uh, there's an, another previous one. I think many of those, unfortunately, you could, could read those today, and, and it would be kind of a, a slightly similar report. So. Matt, welcome to CSIS, and really looking forward to um, your thoughts on progress and obstacles uh, in Somalia. Well, thanks, thanks, thanks very much, Jennifer, and, and thanks to everyone who's, who's come out to, to listen and to talk um, about Somalia today. Um, I'm, I am an optimist. Um, it just might not come through always in, 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 in what I write. Um, and. Um, the title of, of today's presentation, The Race Against Time, I have to admit, I, I didn't come up with that, but I'm grateful that you did, because it's... <laughs> I'm grateful to you, Ben, for coming up with it, because it forced me to focus and to think about um, you know, how, how can we talk about a race against time. It's just over 25 years ago that I was standing on top of the rooftop of the tallest building in Mogadishu, um, watching as the, the rebellion in the city. Um, it had erupted 24 hours earlier. There were tracer bullets arcing up into the sky, and there was the thump of, of rocket-propelled grenades. And I won't say that it was a, it was a moment of celebration. It was, it was a war. It was frightening. But at the same time, it felt like perhaps it was the end of something. The fighting in Somalia had started one could say as early as 1978, and it had, it had ground on through rebellions in, in the central regions, the northeast, the northwest, and now finally was arriving in Mogadishu. And I think at that time, 
um, many of us felt like it was the end of an era. Siad Barre was going to be overthrown, and Somalia would have a new government, and things were going to get better. And I don't think any of us in the city that, that day imagined that 25 years later, Somalia would still be um, enmeshed in crisis, or at least not yet, uh, not yet out of the woods. Um, so after 25 years of crisis, how, how can we be racing against time? And um, I think the answer is, is not that there's necessarily a window of opportunity. We've had a lot of those, and, and uh, uh, the phrase has become overworn when it comes to Somalia. But there are moments where uh, Somalia has the opportunity. We all have the opportunity to move things uh, in a better direction. Or moments like uh, the one that we face now in August this year, where we, we really have to, we require concerted effort to avoid a crisis. And that doesn't make me a pessimist. It makes me, uh, I'm reading the, uh, the political dynamics uh, as they are. Um, and I'm grateful also that you referred to Somalia Redux, because although that, that may have seemed like a pessimistic document, in 2013, um, what I was trying to convey was that Somalia is still in a transition. We may have dropped the transitional epithet from the name of the government, but the constitution is a provisional constitution. Um, there remains much work to be done in terms of state building and um, the elaboration of the political system that Somalia will eventually have. Um, and we had four years in which to accomplish those tasks when the Somali federal government was established in 2012. Um, almost four years later, um, those tasks remain unfinished, and the term of office of this government is coming to an end. And so we have just a few months remaining in order to, um, to choose a course of action, a pathway forward that will keep Somalia on a trajectory to recovery, um, to peace and stability, or could risk introducing uncertainty, instability, um, and in the worst case, potentially conflict. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk about that transition, about the challenges that we face in, in the coming months. Um, and to, um, I won't speak to security issues, to um, uh, some of the, uh, the questions that I'm sure some of you have about Al-Shabaab or about Amazon. We can leave that for, for the discussion afterwards. But um, I think it's, it's essential that we look at, at the politics of the transition, because if we don't get that right, then um, it will be almost impossible to make progress on all of the other challenges that Somalia is facing. So what is supposed to happen in, in August 2016? Term of office of, of the government ends, and something, something new, um, a new political dispensation, should be put in place. Well, the Somali federal government did foresee this. Uh, and in 2013, came up with a plan called Vision 2016, which was supposed to be the roadmap for accomplishing all of these transitional tasks. And there was a lot of criticism of Vision 2016. There, was a, there were comments that it was an attempt to impose Jeffersonian democracy on Somalia. It was a Western-imposed construct. I can tell you from personal experience and having been there and co-authored the document, it was very much a Somali document. It was Somali-owned, and it was based not on an external conception of what Somalia should become. It was based on a reading of the politics at the, of the moment and of the Constitution itself. Because the Constitution required, um, it requires many things, and it's an extremely complex document and often contradictory. But there were a few basic tasks that were unavoidable. The Constitution was to be reviewed uh, and, and, and implemented. Uh, the federal system, the federal structure of the state had to be completed. And a democratic system, an electoral system, um, and institutions had to be put in place. So if you reduce the Constitution to the bare minimum, these were the inescapable challenges for the government to, to overcome. Um, the, uh, perhaps the, the Constitution itself is, is the easiest part of that puzzle. It's, and I, I don't mean that building the Constitution is going to be, going to be easy, but it's fairly clear that the, the, the review 
of the Constitution and the rewriting of it is owned by Parliament. Parliament should establish uh, an oversight committee. The committee will, there will also be an independent uh, commission, the, the Independent Constitutional Review and Implementation Commission, or ICRIC. Um, and uh, there are, I believe, 12 articles that must be rewritten in the Constitution. There are about 22 pieces of legislation that are required to, in a sense, complement the Constitution, where the Constitution itself says a law will elaborate this or a law will explain that. Um, and there are some aspects of the Constitution that need to be rewritten where it's unclear um, or where there is not yet really agreement between the political stakeholders in the country. Um, it's still a difficult process for, for some fairly basic reasons. Um, the Constitutional Review and Oversight uh, Committee and the Commission itself uh, require the participation of the federal member states. Uh, this is where the sort of Isherian nature of the Constitution comes into play. The federal member states don't exist yet. The federal member states, or at least don't yet all exist, they haven't yet been legalized, they haven't been approved by parliament, so how can they participate in the committee? And so in the absence of the federal member states, the lower house of parliament decided to proceed with this process, um, take ownership of it. And what that means is that the, the member states haven't yet been consulted, and it's going to be very problematic if the constitutional review process is completed without the member states having some say in what the final, final document will look like. So that process is, in a sense, frozen. Parliament has been working on it. The committee has been working on it. But it can only go so far before the member states are invited to participate. And I expect that will have to unfold over the next four years under the term of office of the next government. The second pillar of Vision 2016 was the completion of the federal structure uh, of, of governance in Somalia, the member states. And uh, the, it's fairly clear now that at least uh, there will be um, what the member states are going to be. We had, uh, Puntland was already acknowledged in the Constitution as a pre-existing federal member state. Uh, it was followed then by the, the establishment of Jubaland, Southwest Somalia, Galmudug, and now we expect through a state building process in, in Hiran and Middle Shabeli regions that the last piece of the jigsaw would, would fall into place. Um, that's probably the part of Vision 2016 that has moved the most, but it is far from complete and it's, uh, it still faces some very serious challenges. Um, the federal member states, these, just because they are declared, they don't yet exist legally. There is a process to, to follow in, in a sense in ratifying these states. Uh, there is to be a boundaries and federation commission established that will assess the states on the basis of uh, politics, demographics, economic viability and make recommendations to Parliament, and it will then be up to Parliament to endorse or reject the recommendations of the Boundaries and Federation Commission. Um, need, the Boundaries and Federation Commission uh, does not yet exist. It's not functional, again, for, um, uh, for the reasons that it requires the federal member states and the upper house of Parliament to, to endorse it. There is no upper house of Parliament because the upper house of Parliament is to be uh, is to represent the federal member states. So we, we get caught in a bit of a, uh, a loop. Um, and so Parliament has not yet had the opportunity to, to endorse these states. At the same time, there are some challenges some, that, that will emerge. Galmudug, for example, um, let me back up. Federal member states, according to the Constitution, should be based on two administrative regions or more coming together and they should respect the administrative boundaries of the regions in Somalia prior to 1991. So in Jubaland's case, that seems pretty clear. Um, in Puntland's case, it is not because Puntland's borders divide regions and districts. Um, and in Galmudug's case, um, it is not because Galmudug is only a region and a half. So it doesn't meet the constitutional minimum of two regions. These aren't necessarily problems. Because the Constitution accepts Puntland as it stands, and because the Boundaries and Federation Commission could presumably recommend to Parliament that Galmudug should stand as a state and that there is no obvious alternative, 
um, there, there is a way forward, but it is still a requirement that we go through this process and that uh, these recommendations, these exceptions to the constitutional rule will have to be accepted by, uh, by parliament. There is also a question of the facts on the ground. And because the administrative boundaries of Somalia are, um, let's say, arbitrary boundaries, there will always be parts of communities or clans who find themselves um, as minorities uh, or as smaller communities within a state dominated by other groups. And in a normal functioning state, that shouldn't be a problem. But Somalia is, um, we could say, in a post-conflict situation. Um, much of the conflict has been between clans and communities. There are still political tensions and frictions. And so it's quite likely that in some places you'll have communities identifying more with the neighboring state than the state they find themselves in. Again, that doesn't necessarily have to be problematic. Uh, it's as long as it doesn't lead to violent conflict, as long as it doesn't require to a reopening of the debate on the borders of the federal member states, then, um, um, then this is something that can be normalized over time. But it does mean that de facto, we may see that the states don't entirely match up with the communities and the politics of, of, of uh, the political dynamics on the ground. But I think the, the greatest challenge in the, uh, in the completion of the transition is this third pillar of Vision 2016, which is democratization or the elaboration of the, uh, a democratic system for Somalia. And um, this, is, this is immensely problematic today because we don't have a system through which to elect the next government when this one's term of office ends in August. Um, over the long term, um, we can, there will have to be a great deal of, of very serious thinking about what sort of electoral system Somalia needs, what kind of system could unite the country and not tear it apart by introducing a zero-sum political competition in a fragile post-conflict, post-crisis situation. Um, but these are questions that now have to be left for the next Somali government and the commissions that have responsibility for those tasks. The, the immediate question, the race against time that we've spoken about, is what do we do in August? The first uh, challenge is very clear. We cannot have a constitutional transition in August. Um, the, there is no way to respect the Constitution in electing the new government, because there is supposed to be a one-person, one-vote um, election for the lower house of parliament, election of the upper house of parliament, and then the two houses of parliament will jointly elect the next president who will appoint the government. So we're not going to have a one-person, one-vote. We know that. And there are no simple ways just to work around the Constitution and say, um, well, We'll, we'll extend the term of office or we'll do something else. Um, because if the federal government or the parliament decide on a course of action and one or more federal member states decide that this is not legitimate and opt out, then Somalia is back in, in crisis. We have a divided country and we will have uh, potentially a situation where some of the country recognizes the new government and some of the country doesn't and we will have to spend as long as it takes, months or years, in renegotiating um, the, the basic rules of the game through which Somalia will govern itself. So at all costs, uh, we need to, to avoid a scenario in which Somalia is once again divided. Um, and we have much of the, the country perhaps opposing the government. So what do we need? We need a political settlement, a political accommodation in which all of the major stakeholders that is the federal member states, the president, the uh, executive being the, the prime minister and cabinet, and the parliament agree on how we're going to manage this transition. And unfortunately, we're not there yet. We're very close, but we're not there yet. What has been agreed so far by most of the stakeholders, but not Puntland, is that um, the lower house of parliament should be uh, re-elected 
according to the 4.5 clan formula. And for those of you who follow Somali politics, you, you'll know that Somalia, um, in a sense, has an almost infinite number of clans and subclans. But we've, there is an agreement to uh, that the four largest clan groups should be equally represented in parliament, and that a half share is assigned to minority groups. Um, and so 4.5. Um, this is a formula that some Somalis contest and say it's unfair. Others will say that it actually protects the rights of the minorities during, and, and smaller groups during this transition. In any event, we're stuck with it until we can agree on what formula is going to supersede it. So despite the fact that it is largely contested, um, most of the stakeholders have agreed to 4.5 for the lower house. The upper house, um, it has been tentatively agreed, would be um, elected or would be nominated by the member states. It's a pretty straightforward um, formula. The constitution requires that the upper house of 54 seats uh, represent all member states equally. There has been debate over this issue. There are some who've interpreted the constitution in a way that, that it would mean that all of the 18 regions, the administrative regions, should be represented equally. Uh, I think if you look at the Constitution, it's actually quite clear. What it says is that all states must have equal representation and that the representatives in the upper house must come from all of the regions of the country. And I think a, an obvious interpretation is simply that in a member state, which has two or more regions, all of those regions must be given representation. So in Juba land, not all of the, the representatives can come from Lower Juba or from Gedo, but all three of those regions must have their representatives in the upper house. So in the absence of an election, it's been agreed more or less that uh, the leaders of the federal member states would nominate uh, the candidates for the upper house, that these might be endorsed by the state parliaments, um, but it would be a fairly straightforward um, process, and I think less controversial than the lower house. Um, and then the lower house and upper house elect the president. Um, and the, how that happens, whether it's, it will probably follow the pattern of previous elections where there will be up to three rounds of voting in case one of the candidates doesn't get a majority in the first round. And, and that's a process that we've seen enough times in the past now that it, it shouldn't be highly contentious um, as to how that final election the president uh, unfolds. The issue here is that Puntland has not yet signed up to this and contests it, uh, and Jubaland leadership has said that although they will support this formula, they will not do so if Puntland remains outside the settlement. And so we're now in a process of continuing negotiation to see whether this model has to be modified or whether Puntland will finally accept it. Um, and this remains an open-ended question. Uh, the position that Puntland has held is that the election should be based on a different formula, uh, that uh, district-based representation for the, for the lower house would be a fairer formula. And that may or may not be the case. We just don't know because we don't know how many people live in these districts. Um, the, the problem here is that we don't have an agreement between all of the other stakeholders that a district-based election would be acceptable. And for some states who are afraid that they would lose representation under such a formula, they're not going to sign up to it. So we have a deadlock. Um, and the clock is ticking. We have just um, between essentially April and August. If all we had to do before August was to seal the deal and bring in Puntland or modify it in some way, then, then we might have a way forward. But that's not all we have to do. If this model, and I'm going to proceed on the assumption that this model or something quite close to it is actually going to be the basis on which Somalia moves forward, then there's actually a lot still to be thought through, agreed upon in terms of the implementation. Um, let's say that the lower house is going to be elected according to 4.5. So we have 275 seats, which are each assigned to a representative of a 
call it what you will, a clan or a sub-clan or a sub-sub-clan. Every clan has, knows how many seats it has, and it knows which seats are assigned to which sub-clans. So the first challenge is, how do we elect all of these MPs? How does a clan elect its MPs? Well, it is understood within the electoral model that instead of having an election in Mogadishu, where uh, elders essentially select the MPs, that there should actually be an election, that it should probably take place in the regions, in the regional capitals. Um, but that does, that itself raises some challenges. Um, how many electors will vote for each seat and how will they be chosen? If 30 or 50 or 100 members of a subclan are going to vote for their MP, you know, how, who will these voters be? How will they be chosen? Um, there is likely to be competition within communities as to who gets to vote. Um, what will the role of elders be, if any, in vetting and certifying that electors are legitimate representatives of their kinship groups? What about kinship groups that live in different parts of the country and are dispersed? There are some subclans that live in Puntland, but also in Lower Juba. There are other clans that are in uh, Gal Gadud region, but also in Lower Shabele or in Hiran region, but also Lower Juba. So do you just tell them you've all got to go one, to, to one place to caucus? Or do they get to caucus in different areas? Then within clans, the fact that there are not 275 <coughs> clans and 275 seats. There are many more kinship groups. So in, in some clans, there's a practice of, of rotation. That you've had an MP this time, but now for the next term of office, you should give up that seat, and it should rotate to another subclan within, within the family. So how do you decide on that? Are we going to lock in representation to the 275 kinship groups that are currently represented? So there's a lot of political negotiation that has to, to go on, and some, some difficult choices about where to vote and who votes um, that, uh, that have yet to be worked out. Um, and the the uh, decisions that have to be made then about, uh, there are also some groups who will not be enfranchised through this system. If, if each seat is only voted for by members of that subclan, there will be a lot of Somalis whose kinship groups wouldn't get a say at all. And so there are some who are arguing that um, if a particular subclan is going to vote for its member of parliament, that other communities, other kinship groups in that district where that, where that subclan is, 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 say, predominant, should also get a vote so that they have some degree of representation as well. That's going to have to be uh, negotiated. And of course, another major question that arises is, can this process be uniform? So if Puntland wants to vote one way and have 30 electors or 50 electors per seat, and Jubaland wants to vote another way with a different number, or if um, they want to, one, one area will allow subclans living together to vote together, and others will just say, no, only one subclan gets to vote. If it's not a uniform process, is that OK? And that then raises two larger questions. Who supervises this process? Um, who, what is the dispute re uh, resolution mechanism if disputes arise? We can very easily imagine a situation where two politically rival groups from the same subclan uh, claim legitimacy in, in electing a, a member of parliament. We could have a group voting in Adado and a group voting in Dus Mareb, say, claiming the same seat. Who resolves that, that issue? Um, that's not even with the logistics. That's uh, not even the logistics. That's not logistics. That's, that's not the security that has to be no, provided. Sure. Um, and uh, so with just four months and the clock ticking, even if there's an agreement on the electoral model tomorrow, uh, we are going to, we've got some real hurdles to overcome. Um, one last piece of this puzzle um, is that is not yet on the table for negotiation, but I want to suggest to you that it should be. Um, that is the independent national commissions that are supposed to oversee the transitional process. A couple have been formed 
uh, to date, the, um, it, the Constitutional Review and Implementation Commission, uh, the Electoral Commission have been formed. Um, but uh, here again, we already have contestation uh, from some of the member states who are saying we weren't consulted, we don't have representation on this commission. So they see these bodies as potentially being politically biased or not sufficiently inclusive. If these commissions are going to be entrusted with critical tasks like the review of the Constitution, uh, overseeing the next round of elections, the Boundaries and Federation Commission has that critical role of delimiting the member states, making recommendations to Parliament as to you know, how these states should be formed. Uh, and uh, the Independent National Security Commission, which is supposed to be is the constitutional body mandated to oversee the integration of the armed forces and the police, which, as you know, Somalia has militias and police forces and armed forces and Darwish forces all over the territory. Integration is going to be extremely challenging. So these bodies really do need to be not just competent, but they need political buy-in. And perhaps one way to secure um, the ownership of this process across the country and perhaps to, to trade off um, against some of the, uh, the discontent about the electoral formula is that the commissions need to be formed with the participation of the member states, they need rep representation from all of the member states, and I'd go a step further and I'd say that they should operate through reasonable consensus or working consensus. So basically, there will not be critical decisions on the way Somalia is, is reconstituted unless all of the, the key stakeholders agree. We can't afford to have even one member state say, we're out. Um, that, that is just a recipe for continued division and, and, and difficulty. Um, so I would, I'm gonna conclude with, with two thoughts in this, this race against time. One is we need the deal, we need it soon. And we already need to be thinking about the challenges of implementation of this electoral model um, even before, perhaps, the, the settlement is signed and agreed by all of the actors. We must be thinking these things through. That we need to be thinking them through collectively. It's not enough for me or for a commission in Mogadishu or for you to be trying to come up with solutions. We need the member states at the table. We need them talking. Uh, we need a standing body of some kind where every single day between now and August, these issues are being discussed and, and disputes are being resolved. Um, what we don't want to think about is, is what if? What if we don't have an agreement? Uh, the scenarios, I think, are fairly obvious. There are those who will say, we should just extend the term of office of the parliament and the president, the institutions in Mogadishu. Perhaps, but it's a gamble. Uh, it may well be that one or more member states say, we don't accept this. There has to be a transition. We don't agree that you can extend yourselves in office. You're no longer legitimate. And again, we have a divided country. There's another proposal on the table. The parliament should remain, but should elect the new president. Again, it might work. It's also a gamble. Uh, there is almost a structural tension between the federal member states and the current parliament, who both claim to represent the, the populations in their areas. Parliament says, we speak for those people. The member states say, no, we do. And so there is also a risk that some of the member states may, re may reject even the extension of the parliament. And then there is a third proposal on the table, that of a technical extension. That let's just give ourselves another year, another two more years, to figure this all out. We're almost there. Um, again, perhaps, if all of the stakeholders were to agree to that, then it might be plausible. Uh, but there, even if they were to agree, and I suspect that, that they won't, um, two years is really neither here nor there. It's not enough to, to, to put in place an electoral system and address all of the challenges that are pending. Um, we might be able to to resolve some of them. Um, but, but basically, to implement this electoral model that's being agreed to at the moment, we don't need two years either. This is something that can be resolved in a matter of months. So this two-year extension 
is like a mini extension of these ex existing institutions, but it doesn't give us enough time to, to address all the problems. So is it really viable? That will be a decision for the member states, parliament, and the executive to decide. But I, I have to pers say personally, I'm, I'm skeptical. Um, so we don't have a lot of options. Again, all of these scenarios risk, uh, risk the division that uh, I think Somalia desperately needs to avoid. Let's say we make it. Let's say that uh, an agreement uh, is reached and implemented by August, the president selected by September. Well, then the race against time starts again because we'll be where we were in 2012 with a new government, new leadership, eager to demonstrate its legitimacy and its authority, and perhaps quite easily distracted from the transitional tasks that still remain. Vision 2016 becomes Vision 2020. And what we certainly want to avoid is that in 2019, we're sitting here having the same discussion all over again. And so we have to race to the deadline of August, and then on day one of the new administration, assuming we get there, we have to start the the very serious work of completing the Constitution, finalizing the federal member states, and putting in place the democratic system that will lead us to possibly one person, one vote in 2020, or at least as close to it as is realistic at that time. Um, and I think there I should stop and Great. make it open the floor. Sure, and I think thank you for listening. Thank you. Plenty of questions. Thank you so much, uh, Matt. Um, I guess the question to my mind, and I don't know, you read last year the report by Dominique Balbazar. It said, how do, you know, you need to get behind, beyond the roadmap and the formal state building. And I don't know how to kind of, how do you build social cohesion, which after all is kind of at the heart of what makes a democracy or a constitutional process work. And I just wonder if you're able to gauge at all how how invested some of the federal state, the, the uh, subnational state authorities are in this. It seems that Puntland would, you know, the, the, the leverage is in their hands and what do they get from joining and not holding out for kind of 100% of what they want? What's the incentive for a subnational state to, to join? And has that calculation change? Do you see kind of exhaustion or new, renewed will to join a national project in a way? Maybe that's a difficult question to answer, but I, I just, it's, it's are people question. just reluctantly stumbling and checking the box, or do you feel like there's actual commitment to a... I, I, I definitely do think there's commitment. Um, there are just differences about the way forward. First, you know, Somalia is in a, it's in a phase of dialogue. Um, this is not the Somalia of the mid-1990s where people were being killed because of their clan identity or their, their region or even their, their accent. Um, that kind of hostility, animosity is, is no longer present. This is now a political challenge. It's about how do we build the state, not really whether we build the state. Um, with the exception of Somaliland, which sees itself as independent, none of the other units of Somalia is challenging the concept of a united Somalia. Um, and Puntland would, in a sense, would be the first. It has always been uh, clear uh, its commitment is to a united Somalia um, and a federal Somalia. Where I think we do start to have that sort of consensus on state building break down is even over whether Somalia should be federal or not. Um, the federal project has not been embraced by all Somalis. It is a, a place that we've arrived at through multiple conferences, negotiations. Some would say that it was imposed at a given point in time, and now it's enshrined in the Constitution. And not everybody's happy about that. Um, so there, there is, there's resistance, and yet at the same time, um, there were even discussions under this administration about can we change the Constitution? What if, what if uh, we, we reconfigure the way the member states are to be brought together? And I think um, the decision was taken very early on that that was far too dangerous to reopen that constitutional discussion. We might not like federalism. It's what we have at the moment. And perhaps Somali will move through federalism to a, a more unitary project in time. But this is where we are. Now we have to negotiate how it comes together. Uh, I think the will is there. I think that the, the drivers of conflict are substantially absent now from Somalia. Um, it, it's just about 
I wouldn't even say building on momentum, but we, you know, we have to remain focused on the completion of these tasks. And uh, I think we see the will to do that. I would, lastly, I'd say the National Leaders Forum, when they come together, they have very serious and substantive discussions. The leaders uh, may not have thought all of these issues through a year ago, but the more that they meet and the more that they talk about them, the, the more familiar they become. I think the better they understand the challenges and the more likely we are to see, see a pathway forward. Great, thanks. Let's open for questions, comments. Yes, let me start there. Good one. <laughs> um, it's a very thorny issue, and it's a thorny issue because it's one of the key issue, key areas where the Constitution is silent. It doesn't uh, assign ownership of natural resources to anybody, uh, and there are very strongly held views in the federal level and at the federal member state level about um, who will own natural resources. There's also no commission set up to address this, and so the, the commission that I didn't mention uh, would be the interstate commission where the federal member states are supposed to come together and presumably um, negotiate everything that isn't covered by the other commissions and isn't um, addressed in the Constitution. So um, I would assume that the ISC uh, is where natural resources, um, strategic or, or vital economic infrastructure, revenue collection and distribution, redistribution, um, uh, all kinds of issues are going to be addressed. But we don't have it yet. And so um, my personal view is that it is, it is very unwise of any of the actors to assert a prerogative to the control and ownership of natural resources and the, the revenues that might accrue from them um, until we have all of the member states and the ISC is established and we have a forum for negotiation. All it is is creating tension um, and, and, and friction um, that is, is unnecessary, and I'm, I'm sure you're aware uh, there are some, including I think the UN monitoring group, that have called for a moratorium on um, contracts for oil exploration. Um, and frankly, why not? Even if oil were, were to be found today, it'll be probably two governments in the future before anyone's taking it out of the ground, so what's the rush? On the other hand, if you don't get agreement on that, you can see any other agreement falling completely to pieces when it hits that obstacle. So it's kind of a well, absolutely. catch 22. <laughs> yes, it's here. And then, uh, Mike is coming in. You could speak, uh, Mike. I don't know if you recall, you graciously interviewed with me in Nairobi a year ago, and I'm wrapping up my dissertation and defending it in like 10 days. Um, but so, so I have a couple of questions. One is, um, you haven't discussed justice systems and um, what those will look like if the Constitution even addresses those compared to traditional ones. And the second is just your personal opinion about the relative infinite emphasis, that whole can of worms about um, the balance between international support for security issues and international development, humanitarian aid. Are those about right? Are they need to be adjusted? Are they creating tensions? And then I have a third question, too, if you even want to go there. But you said that the conflict drivers aren't the same. It doesn't look like it, it did in the 90s. Well, what changed? What brought about some of that more um, cooperative spirit of addressing conflict rather than um, taking arms? Um, two, two tough questions. Justice uh, is, to a certain extent, the Constitution establishes um, the judiciary as an institution. There's a ju there is to be a judicial commission, which uh, presumably would help to elaborate the, the mechanisms of justice. But um, the reality that has been examined by, uh, I know some excellent Somali research institutions, is that Somalia, Somalia has and probably will have for the, for the foreseeable future three parallel systems of justice. Uh, there will be a, a, a penal code, um, possibly a civil code. Um, there is uh, Sharia law, which is the basis of law or a basis of law. Um, and um, there is customary law. And in places where you have 
better established judicial institutions like Somaliland, like Puntland, these systems coexist and they even compete. Um, where we see people sometimes sort of justice shopping, like forum shopping. I'm gonna get a better deal under Sharia law, so I'll go to the Qadi, or I'll get a better deal under customary law, I'll go to the elders. And the formal systems of justice are still, I would say, underused um, and not yet, um, not, not yet mature, not yet trusted um, to, to take a wider share of, of um, well, to take on their full role. So I, I expect in the South it's gonna be very similar. So the federal government actually began a process of looking at alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, how, how to actually choose between these systems, how to harmonize them, how to at least have, um, have them not operating in some kind of chaotic way, but to, to accept them, recognize them, and make use of them all. Um, but I, I don't think that that process has taken place essentially within the four walls of, of you know, the ministries and Mogadishu International Airport where the international partners are, are largely based and it hasn't yet moved out into the country. So I think it's gonna be a long time before we see any kind of consensus around what justice in Somalia will look like over say the next decade until we have a robust court system again. Um, in, in terms of what changed, um, I'm, not, I, I'm not really sure. I think uh, partly fatigue. I mean, the, the, the bloodletting of the early 1990s was, was terrible, um, and the late 1980s uh, in parts of the country. But then for, if there was one sort of outcome of the United Nations intervention, the US-led UNITAF and then UNISOM in, in the 1990s, is it, is it seems to have established a kind of pause in the conflict so that you know, the, the serious fighting was, it was in 91, 92, um, and then with 34,000 troops dropped on southern Somalia, much of the fighting stopped, not all, there were, but there was still some skirmishing, Kismayo, um, Mogadishu. But by the time UNISOM left, um, the large-scale uh, fighting had ended. The large clan militias that had dominated the early phase of the Civil War had largely fragmented into smaller militias, and the warlords who had led those militias um, were, were no longer popular, they weren't trusted, uh, and I think um, they transformed their militias from fighting on behalf of their clans, which is the way they portrayed the conflict in the, in the early days, basically into mafia, and they just took control of economic infrastructure. They, if you were a warlord, you took a port, you took an airport, or you took a stretch of road and you taxed it. And there was, as long as you didn't have a competitor for that infrastructure, you didn't really need to fight anymore. Clans certainly didn't want to fight. The public didn't want to fight. And I think some kind of, of uh, equilibrium was achieved. Um, and since then, we've actually moved on quite a long way to the point where I think some, the vast majority of Somalis would just like to have Somalia back and functioning. Uh, should we, well, it may come up, it may, yeah. do you want to I'll, I'll talk make, a bit on, okay, make a note so we'll want to where you can answer it well, the, the, in terms of our focus. And I, I think the, um, I, I'm going to get in trouble with some of my friends for this, but I think the main problem with, with um, international assistance has been that it is too focused on Mogadishu in the center. Uh, we have not yet come to terms with the adoption of a federal structure and that we have centers of power and populations who are not dependent on Mogadishu, don't particularly want to be reliant on, on Mogadishu, and they are very frustrated that 90% the, that of the police officers paid for by foreign donors are in the capital, that 90% of the civil servants are in the capital, that the streets of Mogadishu are being rebuilt, but the streets of Bosaso, the streets of Kismayo and Baidoa are not. And so uh, I think that the most important shift needs to be a deconcentration of assistance away from Mogadishu. And I say that not just thinking about what's happening now, but even what happened in 1960, um, where after unification, all the resources went into the capital and there were, there are Somali proverbs, I'm sure some of you know about, you know, even your light gets turned on in Mogadishu, that's where the light switch is. So um, it's long been a structural problem in Somalia and I think this is the time best time to address it. 
we have a report on rethinking uh, engagement in fragile states, and that is exactly one. How are you going to build the capacity of those subnational mm -hmm. governments, too? Um, let's, let's take a question here. Uh, Mike is right behind you. Uh, thank you. Patricia Fagan, Georgetown University. Um, you've outlined a very complicated act, a balancing act between states, between departments, between ethnicities, and to create a federal system that will work and will be truly representative of Somalia. So I'd like to ask you about the very diverse, very vast Somali diaspora, which has been certainly influential throughout the, the years that we're describing here. And I say the diaspora, but it isn't the diaspora. There are different diasporas. And how do you see their role being exercised, or will it be exercised, or is this something that well, you can't keep them out, but what do you see the role of the diaspora as being in the coming months and years? Um, I agree completely. There are Somali diasporas. There are many. And sometimes I'd say Somalia doesn't have a diaspora. Somalia sort of ebbs and flows because there's so much communication, so much movement between the homeland and the diasporas that to try and distinguish between them doesn't actually make a lot of sense. How many of the politicians in Somalia have got foreign passports? Um, most, and not just politicians. Um, uh, over the years, most Somalis, or many Somalis, those who need to travel, have acquired a passport from a neighboring country um, because their own passport hasn't served them. So in a, are they diaspora, not diaspora? They're highly mobile. Transnational. Transnational. Yeah, citizens, um, yes. <laughs> citizens of the world. <laughs> Uh, and the, but I think the, the diaspora is so heterogeneous. I mean, you have diaspora in, in the Middle East, in, in Asia, South Asia, Australia, North America, and Europe, and the values that uh, the, the Somali diaspora holds are so, so diffuse, so diverse, that um, in a sense they are a reflection of all of the divisions and contradictions and, and the diversity of, of the country. So I wouldn't speak about the diaspora per se except in terms of remittances and the estimated $1 billion or $1.5 billion that go back every year and help keep, um, keep the economy, um, keep the country alive, um, keep the, the, the economy functioning. Um, what I would say is that it's definitely a mixed blessing for Somalia proper. Uh, the diaspora bring back skills. Uh, they bring back awareness of, um, of the way other countries function, the way governments can function, institutions, they bring back educational qualifications and professional qualifications. They sometimes also bring back um, even more polarized perspectives on Somali politics. And uh, there is even, in some, some areas, friction between people who are living in the country and those members of the diaspora who come and go. Um, a feeling that you're going to come to benefit run a project, you know, some, at one point they used to be called the laptop returnees, you're going to get a job with an NGO, and then you can leave, but we're stuck here. Um, and so there is some, there can be tension, um, and, and certainly I think if you look at, uh, look at the army of, of returnees who've come in to, to run government over the last few years, uh, there are questions about whether the whether the government is going to be able to sustain the kinds of wages that they need in order to live binational lives, um, or, or whether, the, whether many of them will even stay in their jobs in the civil service uh, when there's a change of administration, or if someone will just pack up and go and we'll get a new group in. Um, so it's, uh, as I said, a, mi a mixed blessing. Yes, let's take one here. Hi, my name is Anis Sumailan Advocacy Group in Washington, D.C. What I see actually, the international community never ever learn mistakes in Somalia because of they try, they try, they try. Is there any way they can try the lastly, just let everybody get out of the room and let the Somalis, only Somalis, try to solve their problem? That's what we did in Somaliland. We've been sitting in Poram for over four months, only Somali, only Somaliland without international community. And we solve our problem and we established government called Somaliland Republic, although we didn't get recognition from, from the world. I don't know why. So let me say one thing also. We know, and I know, by August 2016, 
Mukjisha Eid will never happen one man, one foot. Or I, I should say one person, one foot. Is there any other alternative other than that? Thank you. Um, well, first, I mean, I think the model of Somaliland peacemaking, reconstruction, um, it's, it's exemplary. And yet, at the same time, there seems to be a general sense that it can't be replicated in the South for, for a number of reasons. One is that um, the South, it's at a different phase of conflict. It's also more heterogeneous, um, more, more diverse. And trying to bring together the various strands would be more complicated than it was in Somaliland in 1991, 1993. Um, there is. I think also, realistically speaking, Somalia is not going to be left alone because there is no international community that's going to take a collective decision to step away. There are communities of interest, perhaps, Western donors. There are also the Middle East and the politics of the Middle East are spilling over into Somalia in a way that we've never seen in the past. Um, and the sectarian tensions within the Middle East. Uh, there are the neighbors who obviously for their own security and political reasons, are never going to leave Somalia. Um, there are f other countries like, like Turkey that have taken an interest. Um, and if the Western donors left, would Turkey leave? Is that a good thing, a bad thing? What influence would it have on Somali politics? Um, it's, Somalia is not going to live in a vacuum. And so I think um, although that model of, of, of self-reliance um, if there, if there could be more of that in southern Somali politics and less manipulation from the outside, it would be a good thing. Um, but I'm not sure it's realistic. I think we might just have to live with this interference and, and, and do the best we can. There are some other critical lessons I would flag from Somaliland's experience. It wasn't just making government. When we look at security or insecurity in southern Somalia, I think a lot of people forget that when Somaliland uh, came together and established the Borma Charter uh, that put in place civilian government, there was another charter. There was a peace and security charter. And the peace and security charter was a, was a very interesting document, because what it essentially did was um, it bound the clans represented in Borma at that time to respect the uh, institutions of security in Somaliland, that a police officer or a military officer it, in the conduct of his or her duties um, could not be held accountable for injury or killing of somebody. So if, if you were a police officer and you had to shoot somebody, until that point, the family of the victim would hold you personally accountable or your family accountable, and it started a feud. So how could you possibly enforce the law? And by investing that authority in the institutions of government and saying we will hold government accountable, and so the Somaliland government started to pay the blood compensation instead of allowing feuds to break out. Um, there was a tremendous shift in the way insecurity was handled. And in, in southern Somalia, we still see a police officer is not seen as the representative of a government, but as, as an individual and a member of a clan. And we're going to have to move beyond that. Can we replicate the security charter and some of the other lessons from Somaliland in the south? Um, I don't know. I would say one more thing, and that's simply because you did bring up the, the issue of Somaliland. The issue of Somaliland is not going to go away because we choose to ignore it. Um, and, and we just hope that at some point everybody's going to get along. At some point, um, there is either going to be irresistible friction uh, between Somaliland and, and the South, or within Somaliland over how to deal with, with the South, um, or there is at some point, there's, there's going to be a, a moment that forces, uh, forces the issue. And, and, and it would be really tragic if that involved violence, because we've already seen enough violence in the Northwest in the 1980s. Um, and so uh, I do think that 2017, when we have a new government in Mogadishu and a new government in Hargeisa, will be a window of opportunity. <laughs> um, <laughs> a moment in which it might be possible to establish a framework for dialogue, a serious one with an honest broker that can start to take up this issue and move it forward. But I think ignoring it is just waiting for an accident to happen. Deirdre. Uh, my name is Deirdre. 
My name is Deirdre Le Pen. I was the planning officer for UNICEF until 1990 when we were evacuated and participated in at least two of our evacuation processes. Um, and I pay remittances to my cook even up until today. <laughs> so I'm very Somali in that respect. Um, as an anthropologist, I'm wondering if we can't also look at the Somali situation from a perspective that's somewhat more cultural than just political modeling. I see three big sticky wickets from the standpoint of culture. One was raised by Jennifer, and that is the primacy of the clans and the subclans, which have been very, uh, very successful uh, institutions for welfare and governance. The second sticky wicket is the tendency or the need to make decisions by consensus and to give individuals every individual, even women in many cases, a voice in that process. And the third sticky wicket I see is the absence historically of any Somali leader, overarching Somali leader to whom uh, the other groups can look and around whom they can unify. And now we're looking for presidency, which is a leader of all. Um, so I'm wondering how you would respond to an approach that might take into account those three sticky wickets. I see one possible um, avenue of action, and that is to improve the system of communication. There's a Somali proverb, Somalis live on news and food. And if more news is uh, disseminated about this process, about this change, about the reason for change, and engage people in understanding this process, that cultural change, which we're really looking for, may take place. Yeah, uh, I mean, those are very, they're very interesting thoughts, and I think I, I would agree, I do agree with you. Uh, those are three, um, how to put unavoidable aspects of decision making in Somalia. But I, I also believe that what we're looking at in terms of political modeling is very much a reflection of uh, or an acknowledgement of these, um, these dynamics. Because if we can establish the upper house, and well, let me begin with the lower house. If the elections take place in the regions and are somehow jointly managed between the federal leadership in Mogadishu and the, the leadership of the regions, so that um, the selection of the electors, whoever is going to vote, is somehow a compromise between the center and, and, and the member states, then the regions will feel like they have some indirect representation in the lower house. They will then have direct representation in the upper house. And if the, if the commissions were established the way I suggested, they would also have a direct participation in decisions about state building. So there would be no more laws passed by a parliament in Mogadishu that Puntland or Jubaland or anybody else felt like they hadn't had a say in. They'd be able to resist it in parliament, bring it to a halt. And as you know, then you've got to take that unhappy actor by the hand and walk him or her around the circle and stroke his beard until he's satisfied and comes back in again. So it would be a, a very slow and, and difficult process of accommodation and compromise, um, slower than some would like. But I think bringing all of the stakeholders, major stakeholders together at that level is probably the only way to get a, a degree of political equilibrium and, and a degree of consensus, reasonable consensus so that we don't give vetoes to you know, the squeaky wheels um, in the decision-making process. So I would hope that what we are working towards is something that does acknowledge these realities of, of Somali society. Uh, the, the second part of the question. Communication. Yes, uh, agreed, but also I think not, it's not that, that simple. You know that communication cuts in all directions. So first of all, Official communication is widely received by Somalis as propaganda because that it has often been nothing but propaganda. And I, when I say official, I don't just mean from the government. What UNICEF has to say or UNDP has to say or the US government has to say is always received with skepticism because it's an official communication and it has an agenda or it has some self-serving um, dimension to it. Also because if there is channels of communication are available to all and the other widely you know, sort of unavoidable aspect of Somali culture 
or Somali society is Afmisharism. So if you can use com communication for good, you can use it for bad. And for everybody trying to send a positive message, there'll be plenty of others sending negative messages. And ultimately, Somalis pick and choose what they want to believe. So I, I agree, but I also think it, it wouldn't necessarily be decisive in moving us any further forward. David? David Thrupp, um, CSIS. Um, I've debated whether I should do this or not, and I, I, I've decided I just have to do it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that is, is switch the agenda to Al Shabaab and Amazon. Um, I, I don't want you to go away without picking your brains on that. Uh, does Al Shabaab still have, even in its weakened state, the capacity? to derail most of the things that you've been talking about. And secondly, what is your prognosis about AMISOM? How much longer are the regional powers going to keep their troops on the ground? And if they weren't there, would that also dismantle the whole enterprise you've been outlining? My question also, and, and can you say anything about the status of security sector reform or capacity for Somali? I was going to ask if I could just ignore that question, but now that you <laughs> It was my next question. Now I can't avoid it. Um, one thing um, I, I firmly believe and say probably too often is that the strength of al-Shabaab is the weakness of its adversaries. As long as Somalia, much of Somalia remains a political and security vacuum. Al-Shabaab will always have space. And more than space, it has the initiative because there is no real pressure on Al-Shabaab militarily or even politically in much of the country. Um, and so its leaders have plenty of time to think, plan, prepare, attack, withdraw, attack again. Um, we, we've reached, reached a point of stasis in which Al-Shabaab is quite comfortable. Uh, and because it's such an adaptive and innovative organization, it, is, it tends to do better in, in this situation of stasis than its adversaries do. Um, that said, um, Shabab is not as, uh, I, I think, not as weakened as, uh, as some portray it. True, it is not, I, I don't talk about al-Shabab partly because I don't see it as the problem in Somalia. I see it as a symptom of the problem. It's a symptom of a failure to build functioning institutions of governance. But over time, um, you know, it is, it is putting down roots. Uh, it's not a popular movement. It doesn't have a, a, a coherent or a cohesive constituency in the country. It has little bits and pieces, bubbles of grievance that it appropriates and it exploits for its own purposes. And these grievances aren't united. They, they may be groups of people who have nothing to do with one another and really have no interest in al-Shabaab. But if they're unhappy with another group, or their st state government, or the federal government, or something, um, then it, they'll open the door to al-Shabaab and, and tolerate it and flirt with it. So I, I don't think it's, it's going to be particular. It should be as difficult as it's proving to contain al-Shabaab and eventually eliminate it. But al-Shabaab is, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very robust organization. And it is, in, at, at the moment, it is functioning a bit like a shadow government. And, and like a, a shadow government, a protection racket, a mafia-type organization, it probably collects more taxes in Mogadishu than the government does, almost certainly. Um, it is more involved in many ways in resolving disputes and solving problems for everyday people than, than government is. Uh, it's seen as, its form of justice is often seen as more impartial and more uh, serious and decisive than that of official uh, the official dispensation of justice. Um, if you do business in Somalia, you pay al-Shabaab. That's an open secret. You must. If you don't pay, then your telecommunications masts get blown up, your offices get attacked, your personnel get killed, so you pay. And until the government can protect you, why would you not? And do we want to deny telecommunications services, money transfer services, other types of services to the Somali public because al-Shabaab is there? So we, we're in a, in a dilemma. And al-Shabaab exploits that for its own purposes. It's now where it gets most of, most of its money from. Um, and I, I think this, 
it's, it's not enough to say, well, we need effective government, and then al-Shabaab will go away, because obviously we're far away from having effective government. I do think that, um, although I'm not an advocate of federalism, I, I don't necessarily believe that the federal structure is going to work well for Somalia. Perhaps Somalia will need to go through it to something else. But at the moment, <coughs> this federative process where authentic centers of power, authorities that have constituencies, however limited they are, forces, money, are trying to establish federal member states, administrations in different parts of the country. Um, right now, this is the greatest challenge to al-Shabaab. Al-Shabaab in the Jubas is less concerned about the Somali National Army than about what Jubaland is doing. Al-Shabaab in Puntland isn't worried about the Somali National Police, they're worried about Puntland. And in Somaliland, the same thing. So it's, it seems to be right now at this decentralized level that there is the, the greatest pressure on al-Shabaab. Um, it's going to take a long time before you know, national institutions grow sufficiently to take up some of that responsibility beyond the capital. Um, some people would say we're not doing enough, we're not moving fast enough, we should be investing more in these national institutions, but that's also problematic. That's the centralization that I've spoken about. Um, security ultimately in the member states will probably be secured by state police, not federal police, or a combination of the two. Um, and um, you know, the army such as it is can only function in parts of Somalia. If it's deployed outside certain areas, it's going to be unwelcome and seen as a hostile force. So until the army is a fully national integrated force, it won't be able to take up that role either. Do you want to speak about Amazon and, and also kind of the regional? I mean, you're based in Nairobi, yeah. and Kenya has taken a lot of big hits recently. Right? Yeah. Um, it's Amazon, there are a lot, there's, there's a lot of discussion. Is Amazon big enough? Is it not big enough? Does it have everything that it requires in order to do the job? Um, I don't, there aren't easy answers to that question. Um, Ethiopia secured the same territory with fewer troops in 2007, but of course it wasn't able to hold it. That, there's an important lesson in there. Uh, UNISOM secured the same territory with more troops, 34,000, but also wasn't able to hold it. So is 22,000 the right number? Is it too much, too little? Uh, anybody's guess. We've seen more, we've seen less, um, and it still hasn't worked. Uh, in, in my view, Amazon could be doing more with what it's got, but it can't do much more. Um, it's, it's a bit of a mystery why seven years after Ethiopia withdrew and Amazon took up the lead, that Al-Shabaab is still allowed to hold major towns like Jalib and Jamame, and there's no military pressure to dislodge them. Um, it, it would not require much, based on the experience that we've seen, to push al-Shabaab out of the remaining major towns and to um, leave it as, as simply a rural presence without that very useful access to the sea and the revenues that port towns generate. Although, as I said, it's now taxing inland. So um, displacing it from ports isn't going to be fatal. But it, it, it's also symbolically quite important that they have these centers that they control and that they administer. Um, the even if Amazon could do more, though, I think beyond pushing Shabab out of those major towns, um, that's probably about as far as it can go. Because you know, even if Amazon were to chase Al Shabab, pursue it, patrol more aggressively, ultimately this is a Somali fight. It's not foreign troops in Somalia that are going to uh, dismantle Al Shabab. It, it has to be communities that decide that their boys put down their weapons, they come back into the community. They can believe what they want, but they don't pick up the gun. This is the way al Ittihad was, was largely dismantled uh, between 1990 and then 96 when Ethiopia sent its forces in uh, to, to, to destroy the remaining bases. But this was largely a community process, and it's going to be very, very similar. We've, we've seen some communities more or less tell Shabab they're not welcome, and we know one by one who the members of al-Shabab are from our, our clans or our community. So once Amazon has expanded a little bit further and perhaps improved, you know, put a little more pressure on al-Shabaab, then, it, then what, where are the Somali forces that are going to secure these areas? And where is the leadership to guide this process of 
of um, community resistance to Al-Shabaab. And I think there, again, um, it's going to have to be, a, it can't all be on the shoulders of the federal government. The federal government is, is at this stage in Somalia's transition not the right level. Uh, it can do some things. It can create a framework. It can encourage and support the member states. But it's much closer to the ground that some of this fighting, policing, and um, sort of community reintegration and healing has to take place. Um, and so again, it, I see a forum of the federal government, the federal member states, and their security organs coming together to agree on how to do this and to coordinate their efforts as being critical. Should we take, uh, yeah, in the, in the far back? Let me check the time. Maybe we'll take two this time. Um, hello, uh, my name is uh, Nimra in Somali, and I'm an Arabic, and you can call me Nima. I'm part of the Somalian diaspora that lives in Saudi Arabia, and I'm here doing uh, international training education at AU. So my question would be, um, what is education, uh, or how much Al-Shabaab has influence in education, and what is happening in educating the, you know, the generations that are coming up, and what does it mean in regards to nationalization, and what, what does it mean for them to be Somali, and how can, what would be your advice to educators, uh, educators and policymakers in regards to making peace and progress. Thank you. There's, there's a gentleman right before you. Let's take the two together. Hello, my name is Yasin, and I'm from uh, Paris C48. Uh, my question to you, Mary, is uh, last week uh, there was uh, Poland forces, security forces were able to uh, end uh, uh, an expansion item by Shabab to the northern part of it. And this is not only uh, due to the security forces, but an entire community, an entire uh, Poland state were able to come together and go, go towards Shabab. How do you see that uh, model or that example can be replicated to inside Mogadishu or uh, through the SN SNA uh, military? So education? And Puntland. Uh, Two very buffing. different questions. Yes. <laughs> um, you might have to remind me okay. <laughs> halfway through. I'd like to answer the education question from a slightly different perspective, because I think the challenge of education in Somalia is for, it, it's not just Somalia. It's the region. We, we're, we're facing a, a series, we're, we're facing a combination of factors that are um, putting a lot of stress on youth. We have a youth bulge that's probably going to last until 2050 or beyond. Um, by some projections, the, the youth population of the African continent will be equal to the current population of the African continent in, in less than half a century. Um, at the same time, we're seeing urbanization, uh, a growing middle class, uh, which means connectivity to the internet, um, access to information, and um, some of the results of these trends, by no means all, some of this is, is very good, very positive, but where there are not sufficient opportunities for youth, they are opting out of potential pathways. They're, they're finding their own way. And the two, the two key challenges right now in the Somali region are Tahrib al migration, getting out of the region, or radicalization, being and that doesn't have to be al-Shabaab. We see it also among the youth in Kenya. We see it in Tanzania. It's, it's, these are choices that, that many youth are taking. What do you do? And I think this is, this is the challenge that education has to, has to address. Um, it's not just about equipping about um, what are kids learning, but it's, does education equip them with a pathway where they can see that there's no, no need to get on a bus to Togwajale and then try to cross the Libyan desert in the hope that maybe you'll end up in Germany or Sweden. Um, there should be something for you at, at, at home. Um, or, and I, I've interviewed uh, young people who joined Al-Shabaab, some of whom tried to blow themselves up and failed. And in a way, these are the products of, of the success of Western donors. Someone from a fairly respectable family uh, who made it past the age of five without getting the major diseases, who went to a secondary school um, and who, who should be um, sort of the emblem of what developmental assistance and support can do for a family, but instead decided to blow himself up. And because at some point there was just no other way forward, it was just too attractive to join a movement that offered you a group, status, a mission, a very attractive um, 
proposal that you could right wrongs and fight injustice. And, and I think it's, you know, a lot of young people, I, I remember being very, very attracted to any cause to, to redress a wrong when I was younger. I hope I still am. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, it's, that's, that's when youth are very vulnerable. And, uh, and so it's a much wider challenge. And I do think that some of the educational models we see, some of the religious educational models are superior in that they offer almost a cradle-to-grave pathway. You can see where you're going next. You will have a position of responsibility, whether at a school or in a mosque, or you'll be introduced to business connections, or you can, you can take the, uh, the jihadist route and you can become a, a leader of men and go and, and, and fight or, or die. Uh, but um, there are other systems that are too fragmented you know, we support primary school, but not enough secondary school. We support secondary school, but not post-secondary. If, if you do go through school, the economy can't absorb you. There's no jobs for you anyway. Or the message of your, your government is, well, be a good middle-class citizen, get a mortgage. That's not what you want to hear when you've just come out of, of, of uh, your education and you're looking to, to, to do something in the world. So there, there, is, there are challenges, but I think it's really about establishing pathways for youth and giving them a vision to see where they, where they, what they can achieve um, instead of throwing up their arms and picking one of these, uh, these other options. And I'm afraid that tomorrow it might not be Tahrib and it might not be Al-Shabaab. We'll, we'll see others. It can be drugs. It can be crime. It can be anything. And so we, we, have, we have a big, big challenge to address there. The uh, last, uh, second and last question yeah. is Puntland and rebuffing communities and security forces rebuffing. Well, on the one hand, yes, Hussein, yes. Puntland came together. Puntland that is, like every other part of Somalia, wrapped around its internal politics, sometimes divided, fractious, difficult, but uni unified forces who hadn't been paid for months, stopped complaining, went to the coast, started to fight al-Shabaab, and scored what what seems to have been a major victory. And I think, you know, that it's not just in Puntland that, that we've seen that. I think uh, we've seen that with Al-Sunnah wal um, when when it first came together to fight Al-Shabaab in the central region. Whatever its shortcomings as a movement, it had that same kind of dynamism. And, uh, you know, the, the Ras Kamboni, I find Ras Kamboni and now the Jubaland forces very interesting because you know, many of them came out of Al-Shabaab, and they know Al-Shabaab intimately. And that is a, that's a very up-close and personal fight that they're engaged in in Kismayo. And, and the, uh, so it, I, I take your point. It's, a, it's an example others can follow, and some are following. Um, now, how do, you, how do we pull these threads together in something that's more coherent and doesn't leave Shabaab the opportunity to slip over here or shift over there or bide its time and come back? But the other thing I'd say about Puntland is that it still has a Shabab problem. Defeating al-Shabab on the coast doesn't mean that they're not in Puntland. If you drive at night between Bosaso and, and Garoue, and you pass Yalho, and you pass Lag, you don't know whether you're going to be stopped by al-Shabab, because they've found a local grievance. They are there, and they can come down from the hills and, and stop your car, look for who's wearing a uniform. It's dangerous. It's in Somaliland as well, uh, Shabab is there. Uh, the Djibouti bombing, La Chaumière, many of the people who were involved were operating out of Somaliland. Sh Shabab were traveling through Somaliland. So I think, again, while a lot can be done with this mobilization of forces and this sort of kinetic operational response to al-Shabab, it still comes back to communities making decisions as communities, self-policing, um, and and making it unacceptable um, to be a member of al-Shabaab. And then the kind of intelligence-led policing and counterterrorism work that you know, is required to go after those last remaining hardcore um, who are not going to be persuaded by their families and who are not going to give up the fight. Um, but, but first, I think we have that social, social mobilization to, to engage in. We are at time. <coughs> Keep it short. Matt, thank you so much. I always learn such a great deal, and I think the audience as well. Um, thank you thank very you. much, and uh, look forward always to having you back. Yeah, absolutely. All right, thank, thank you. you. <laughs>